During the 90s and 2000s, Nintendo reached wide critical and commercial success for their video games, success that Disney and Square Enix were searching for themselves. Unlike Square, a game company first and foremost, Disney's reputation revolved around the animated movies, and their gaming department was still trying to really break through in the industry. Sure, some of their games did pretty well, and Final Fantasy VII was a significant Square release, but both companies wanted more. While Disney wondered how to make a game that struck gold, Square wondered, how can we do that again? So since Disney's Japanese division and Square shared a building at the time, both company executives met in an elevator one day, joined forces, and began working on a little crossover title called Kingdom Hearts. The game was created with star power in mind, from renowned musical artist Utada Hikaru singing the openers for Kingdom Hearts 1, 2, and 3, to promoting American celebrities like Jesse McCartney for voice acting. The first game was released in March 2002, and by the following year, it sold 3 million copies worldwide. Now the series is the only AAA ongoing Disney game that isn't a Star Wars or Marvel title. While the series is still wildly popular to this day, many have brushed it off as nothing more than confusing lore and flimsy writing. These takes do have a little merit, but claiming the series has little to offer is disingenuous. The games are frustrating sometimes, but they have a lot going for them that makes it worthwhile. Kingdom Hearts doesn't sound like it'd work. It sounds like it wouldn't have resonated with so many people for so long. But the crossover appeal of Disney and Final Fantasy characters isn't the only thing that captivates people. Most of the series is also consistent with setting up specific story elements. For its ups and downs, Kingdom Hearts is committed to its storytelling from how it uses its IPs to strengthen the world building, how friendship's power is woven throughout the games, and the series' unflinching faith in its premise. This is gonna be a long one, and not everything I say will be positive. But for now, I can explain why I'm so passionate about these games in the first place. With this new era of Kingdom Hearts looming on the horizon, I couldn't think of a better time to make a video on something that I love so much. I've been playing this series since I was 10, and ever since, I couldn't get enough of it. And you can see that by how it's everywhere on my channel. From my profile pic to background music and my videos, all the games in the series have banger soundtracks no matter what. I'll be using the very first game as my primary example for the next two sections, but I'll reference other games here and there. If I tried covering all the games with the same amount of detail for each section, I'd never finish this behemoth. Sadly, I can't include every piece of lore. I will be explaining a lot anyway. Despite how it looks, this isn't a Kingdom Hearts channel, so I want to keep that in mind for some people. I love watching random video essays about random things too. It happens. Also, huge spoiler warning, maybe you want to play the all-in-one collection first. Please don't get the Cloud Switch version. You can only play it through an internet connection and it's been known to lag and crash because of it. So what's the point of having a portable console if you can't play the game on the go with no internet? But with that out of the way, on to the analysis! Kingdom Hearts follows Sora a boy who wants to explore beyond his island with his best friends Riku and Kairi. When their home's destroyed, Sora's thrown into another world and obtains a mysterious weapon called the Keyblade. With Donald and Goofy's help, he goes on an adventure to find his friends and King Mickey. They meet familiar faces, learn more about the story's lore, and encounter Heartless, monsters that also destroyed Sora's island and will not stop until everything's covered in darkness. KH's plot gets more detailed with each game release, but no matter how layered it gets, the series makes sure to include the characters in the world building. KH's main selling point is its Disney and Final Fantasy crossover. Donald Duck knows who Sephiroth is and no one blinks. I'm not joking. Sephiroth! 
Though this crossover sounds out of left field, the original characters and lore work like a bridge between these IPs. The human characters have fun with fancy faces, but they also have big hands reminiscent of classic Disney cartoons. Teenagers like Sora, Riku, and Kairi wear brighter, more cartoony fashion, especially obvious with their bigger shoes. This isn't always the case, but the kids will be ridiculously shorter than the adults. Sora's design is specifically based on Mickey Mouse with his yellow boots and red jumpsuit. He's a stand-in for Mickey and the player to an extent, but he has his own personality. Most worlds Sora, Donald, and Goofy travel to are directly based on Disney movies. Olympus Coliseum is based on Hercules, Atlantica is based on The Little Mermaid, and so on. Later games follow movie narratives more closely, making the stories within Disney worlds more self-contained. But they're still affected by the series' overarching plot just enough that they're never completely separate from the original storytelling. Heartless show up, darkness consumes a villain or two, the works. The worlds have their own set of rules in KH as well. Almost every world has a heart of its own and the gateway to that heart is a keyhole. Keyholes must be sealed so the Heartless won't destroy these worlds. The Disney worlds aren't exempt from this potential fate and Sora has to go to multiple ones to seal keyholes away. KH goes the extra mile to contextualize these places both in the narrative and gameplay by making them actual planets in space. Sora can finally go to Disney World and you can too. Other Disney characters team up with Sora, Donald, and Goofy to defeat the Heartless and villains from their respective worlds. Some characters have repurposed positions and motives that still align with their personalities and expected roles in other media. Along with Donald and Goofy's roles as Wizard and Knight looking for the Keyblade Wielder, Mickey Mouse is their mysterious, powerful king who shows up when he's needed. His only appearance on screen is at the end of the game. Jack Skellington tries using the Heartless for Halloween experiments. Ariel doesn't explicitly say she wants to become human, but emphasizes seeing different worlds instead. Even Genie and King Triton know about the Keyblade beforehand. It makes sense for them to have such knowledge with their omnipotent powers. As the Keybearer, you must already know one must not meddle in the affairs of other worlds. A few Disney and Final Fantasy characters don't just talk to each other either, but live in the same world because of the lore. Traverse Town serves as both the hub area for the player to buy items and a refuge and narrative for anyone who's lost their world to darkness. A whale swallows up Pinocchio and Geppetto, but they can't go back home like they did in the 1948 movie. They end up in Traverse Town and Squall Leonhardt, yes, gives them a place to stay in the first district. A more specific example of repurposing comes from the Seven Princesses of Heart. They're mostly made up of Disney female protagonists with hearts of pure light and can therefore summon the final keyhole and gain access to the entity Kingdom Hearts. Hey, that's the name of the show. Not to mention how various Disney villains band together to achieve Kingdom Hearts ultimate power by attaining these seven hearts. The console of villains can control Heartless too, which makes them overlap more with the world building. Most of the princesses even hold the darkness at bay so Sora can seal the final keyhole. Many Final Fantasy characters also have a shared backstory for the games. Radiant Garden was their home before it was destroyed 10 years ago, making it a hollow bastion, if you will. <laughs> They've lived in Traverse Town ever since. They help Sora understand the powers of the Keyblade and he learns more about Radiant Garden in KH2. The gameplay reinforces this world building with summons and side quests. After Sora goes to Agrabah Neverland, he gains Genie and Tinkerbell summons after Aladdin and Peter Pan ask them to join Sora in his quest. Simba becomes a summon gem through a strong heart, escaping his world to destruction and landing in Fairy Godmother's possession until she asks Sora to keep it safe with him. Two side quests task the player to restore Disney characters that were lost throughout different worlds. Disney's version of Winnie the Pooh comes in the form of an unfinished book, where some pages have been torn out and scattered. You can also find the 99 Dalmatian puppies and reunite them with Pongo and Purdy in Traverse Town. With all this repurposing, the IP crossover is much more believable than it seems at first. These pre-existing components are usually more than uninteresting easter eggs, and the simple easter eggs that are there are fun! If you already knew about both IPs, the more you play, the less drawing it is to see Hades and Cloud make a deal. I mean, story-wise, not visually, like in KH2 when the gang meets Jack Sparrow and, uh, yeah. Don't worry, it'll pay off later, I promise.
The world building helps Sora live out his dream to travel beyond his island, but through doing that, his ongoing goal to find Riku and Kairi also ties in with the most prominent theme of the series. <clears throat> Let's see here. We got a car key, piano key, skeleton key. The keyblade is strong, but it's much better with the strength of friends. KH loves emphasizing the power of friendship and what people will do for it. The theme of friendship's power is set up in many ways, from a character's actions to the gameplay. Though they aren't together for very long on Destiny Islands, Sora, Riku, and Kairi's friendship is believable. They jokingly call each other names, talk about exploring worlds together, and play games. Their dialogue and group activities flesh out their connection and establish that they've known each other for a long time. That's why it's even more powerful that they do the things they do for each other. While Sora goes on his adventure, Riku is looking for Kairi's heart. The first trip to Hala Bastion reveals that she was one of the seven princesses all along, and her heart was resting within Sora after Destiny Islands was destroyed. Learning all this, what does Sora do? He stabs himself to free Kairi's heart and restore the other princesses with a smile on his face. Yeah, his whole motivation for his journey is finding his friends. He may have already wanted to explore other worlds, but he only does so because Riku and Kairi are missing. And through his sacrifice, he wakes Kairi up. He will literally die for his friends and he won't hesitate. He also falls to his knees from finding Riku again in KH2 after a whole year of looking for him. Riku could have still been evil and Sora wouldn't have known. He probably wouldn't have cared either way. He loves them both so much, stop separating them! Meanwhile, Riku is a unique case because his deferring motives and underlying jealousy cause him to fall from grace. He wants to gain power and protect Kairi by any means, so much so that he puts Sora in danger and harms other characters that could have voluntarily helped Riku if he wasn't so forceful. His jealousy over Sora's ability to wield the Keyblade causes Riku further strife. Maleficent's manipulation doesn't help either. While you toiled away trying to find your dear friend, he quite simply replaced you with some new companions. He grows so power hungry that he gets possessed by the main villain of KH1, Ansem, Seeker of Darkness. But when Ansem threatens Kairi in Hollow Bastion, Riku momentarily breaks away from Ansem's control so Kairi can escape. After all he's done, he still cares for her. Riku's more villainous actions put a toll on him in future games, where he's forced to be alone for much of the story and has less people to rely on, unlike Sora. In Chain of Memories, Ansem's influence torments him, and most characters he meets are enemies. Till KH2, Riku can only rely on Mickey, and when he reunites with his best friends, they welcome him back with open arms. He mends his bond with Sora and learns that he doesn't have to walk the road to dawn on his own. While she doesn't get much to do throughout all of the games, Kairi is an emotional support powerhouse too. In Hollow Bastion, after Sora restores the Princesses of Heart by stabbing himself, he becomes a Heartless. Kairi recognizes him when Donald and Goofy don't. She immediately shields him from the other Heartless with an embrace, bringing him back from the darkness and turning him human. And in KH2, she also brings the Destiny Island trio together for their reunion, telling Sora to look into his heart to understand that Riku took Ansem's form. Kairi sees her closest friends for who they really are and accepts them, even if they don't look like themselves. In KH, friends will do anything for each other, consequences be damned. It may mean hurting each other in the process or endangering themselves, but they'll always find a way back together. The most obvious example of how powerful friendship can be within the story is when Sora, Donald, and Goofy meet Riku in Hala Bastion. Sora loses his Keyblade, but he's really at his lowest point in the game when he loses Donald and Goofy after bonding with them. They leave him when Riku steals his Keyblade, but when Riku tries attacking him, Donald and Goofy change their minds. Their friend's safety is more important than strictly following King Mickey's orders and Sora is ultimately powerless without his friendships. His weapon isn't what makes him special, it's his friends and his ability to connect with those around him. He regains his Keyblade only after learning that. I don't need a weapon. My friends are my power. Huh? Huh?
The themes of friendship and connection are infiltrated in the gameplay too, specifically with Trinity Links and Summons. To gain Trinity Links, you need Donald and Goofy in your party, and you need them both alive. These links have you work together to unlock rewards and create powerful attacks. In fact, all other party members level up with Sora. Though he's the only playable character, other characters that fight alongside him aren't stagnant within battle, and they have their own skills and movesets that improve like his do, though to a much lesser extent. Sora also shouts, Give me strength! when calling upon other characters to help him in battle, specifically for summons in the Trinity Limit. This is mostly the same for other games, but even something as small as placing a quote with certain battle commands reinforces how powerful friendship is in this series. The Keyblade may be a powerful force, but a strong heart with strong bonds is what makes that force so important for Sora and other Keyblade wielders like him. With themes of friendship and Disney characters in tow, KH has provoked the ire of many people from the outside looking in. The games have been a target for ridicule because of the mere idea of the premise alone. Mickey Mouse beats up Sephiroth with no hint of irony, you say? Huh, how laughable. But what if I told you the lack of irony is also what makes the series work so well? Keyhole, key lime pie. <gasps> Self-aware writing can be great. It can be funny and well done. It's a neutral thing to implement in storytelling and it definitely has its place. That being said, it's not fit for every kind of story. You'd expect self-aware writing to appear in a comedy before a tragedy. This isn't always the case, but like all other kinds of writing methods, it can help or hurt a story. And KH would not be the same if it constantly made fun of itself. Instead of mocking its dramatic and emotional tendencies, KH plays it straight. No matter how weird things get, the faith in its premise never falters. It's not that KH is never aware of strange events within its storytelling, nor will characters accept these events without hesitation. Run, run away! Okay. But the events themselves are rarely reflected on in ways that are cynical or at least constantly tongue-in-cheek. The sincerity is still going strong after all this time. KH3 arguably has the only self-aware joke in the series, but the joke is about how long it took for KH3 to finally get released with all the partial number titles in between. 1.5, 2.5, 3.58 over 2, 0.2, 2.8. These numbers do make sense for the titles, but I'm just shocked they snuck in a joke like that. It's super cute. It would have been very easy to use lampshading every 10 minutes for something like KH, but the series avoids writing like this and uses other kinds of humor instead. <laughs> for one thing, I'm glad KH3 leaned more into comedy without making blatant one-liners about the core essence of these games. We can suspend our disbelief much easier without calling attention to it. This can't be said about other modern Disney properties like Moana. The ocean chose you for a reason. If you start singing, I'm gonna throw up. Ralph breaks the internet. Do animals talk to you? No. Were you poisoned? No. Cursed? No. Kidnapped or enslaved? enslaved? No. Are you guys okay? Should I call the police? The Beauty and the Beast remake. And... Who marries a man she just met? Well, you know. It's true love! Whoa! <laughs> KH presents narrative cutscenes as is, whether it's warranted or not. A muscular anime man mumbles to himself about the darkness as Minnie Mouse watches on and the player is supposed to keep a straight face. But not all drama is created equal. As much as people like to take various tense scenes out of context, KH can get surprisingly raw. The games explore what it means to fight for your identity, lose your childhood innocence, keep faith in the people you love, and much more. Remember that anime man mumbling about the darkness? That's Terra. He and his two best friends Aqua and Ven were first introduced to KH through the 2010 title Birth by Sleep, a prequel game that takes place 10 years before the events of KH1. Like Riku, Terra struggles with the darkness and longs for power he couldn't easily get. While he's much less willing to hurt others like Riku was, he still gets possessed and used as a pawn in the villain's plan. Instead of Ansem this time, it's Xehanort, 
a much bigger, badder force of evil that sets the next 10 years in motion. Riku is able to regain his body and reunite with his friends, but Terra, Aqua, and Ven aren't so lucky. Their sacrifices for each other lead to tragedy. Aqua gets stuck in the realm of darkness and Ven ends up in a comatose state. Xehanort successfully possesses Terra's heart and body, hijacking his personhood for over a decade. But even after Terra loses himself, he still keeps fighting. He's so hellbent on getting his friends and identity back that his consciousness manifests into his keyblade armor for one more Xehanor battle. Terra's armor is physically empty at this point. He's holding it together with sheer willpower and he keeps this up for as long as Xehanor possesses his being. Terra's that determined to restore his body, his heart, his friends, his promise to set this right epitomizes the lingering will. And when it stands before the newly possessed Terranor, he's baffled. Your body submits, your heart succumbs. So why does your mind resist? One game features a more infamous line sandwiched in between the drama. 358 Days Over 2 takes place shortly after KH1, after Sora sacrificed himself and became a heartless. His strong will created a nobody. A nobody is like a strong-willed human clone with no heart. Nobodies can exist while their original forms are still around, but it's not recommended so long as those nobodies lack hearts of their own. Roxas is Sora's nobody. Turns out there are other nobodies like him who all want hearts too, and they want this so badly that they join Organization 13 with that goal in mind. During his time in the organization, Roxas befriends Axel and Shion. However, Shion learns that she was a puppet the whole time, a collection of Sora's memories of Kairi. Roxas has his own problems with being a nobody, but Shion doesn't even have her own original form to go to because her existence is made up of another person's memories. Someone else is already Kairi's nobody. So, Shion has an identity crisis. She has to rejoin Sora's heart, and when the time comes, Roxas battles it out to prevent it. But he can't. As Shion lays fading away in his arms, she rests a hand on his face. Roxas catches her fingers as they slip away, and he says, Shion, who else will I have ice cream with? This is one line people love to laugh at with or without context, but it makes sense if you know the meaning behind it. When Roxas thinks of friendship, he thinks of eating ice cream with his friends because Axel told him that's what friendship is. He, Roxas, and Shion bond through eating seesaw ice cream. They never had normal lives outside Organization 13. It's all they know. And despite their lack of hearts, these three characters still managed to form a true friendship. Outside forces took that away. Roxas cries for his friend's death, and nobodies don't experience true emotion. This may sound like a silly line, but when Roxas asks Shion who else will have ice cream with him, he's asking who else will be his friend. He already defected from the organization and now distrusts Axel because he kept Roxas and Shion's origins a secret. Roxas believes he lost one friend, and he's losing another. His bond with them is so strong that he breaks the rules of his existence and shows grief he was never supposed to truly feel. But not everything in KH is so tragic. Some of the drama is just fun. KH2 has this one scene where Goofy's assumed dead, and Mickey leaves to get revenge on the Heartless that seemingly caused his friend's demise. Donald's in a rage and Sora's in denial. This is not happening. It can't be happening. It can't. Of course he's not dead, but the game acts like he is, at least for a little while. The characters believe he's dead. They don't crack jokes. Them and Vigor starts playing in the background, and Mickey's so mad that he tears off his coat and dashes away with his keyblade. Goofy's forced out the party system with an ominous message, and Sora's teaming up with Final Fantasy characters to destroy Heartless. As short-lived as the drama is here, it's Fun. How many times do you get to see Mickey Mouse be a bona fide cool guy in official Disney material? KH can be unintentionally funny, yes, but its overall seriousness is admirable for games with Donald Duck in it. The games don't care if you laugh at Woody telling off a pretty anime man. This cutscene will be framed with the emotional weight it deserves. Wait, that Woody? Yes! That Woody, and KH couldn't care less. This unflinching faith wouldn't totally work if the games didn't give us a reason to care for these characters even a little, though the writing for some isn't always 
good, they still have strong foundations and everyone is very driven, no matter what they do with that drive. With familiar themes and tropes, KH is still a story unlike any other. It embraces things like the power of friendship, fairy tale elements, and the hero's journey. It's no Toni Morrison novel, but the series has its moments. There are too many to count. It has unique components that you can't get anywhere else, and it has a heart. It's very ambitious and secure in its tone. KH's story, concept, and themes are uninhibited by insincerity. It tells an oddball story with such grandiose framing, beautiful soundtrack and all, that it convinces you to take it seriously, or at least have fun with it. It exemplifies taking risks without holding creativity back, and it's endearing just for that. Thinking outside the box doesn't guarantee critical or financial success, and it's hard to execute stories well, but there's always a chance of making something really special. KH managed to do all this and more. Hey, where are you going? It's not a critique if I don't say anything negative, and I have a lot to say. Why do so many adult KH fans dislike the Disney stuff? Just like various other companies, Square markets to adults by selling expensive merch that isn't made for kids. I understand that I am part of the adult demographic they're trying to cater to, but I also remember that this is still a children's game at the end of the day. I can't say that for much of the Kingdom Hearts fandom. A lot of fans don't like the Disney stuff at all and want the games to have a darker tone, but that's not what KH is about. Disney makes up half of the marketing appeal, and that includes the theming that comes with its brand. This series is never going to be as edgy as some of you want it to be. We can talk about how much of the demographic is made up of people who are already emotionally invested, and lots of those emotionally invested people are also adults who have been longtime fans since childhood. But I'm sorry, if you want something more mean-spirited, don't play the game with Winnie the Pooh in it. I wish the treasure chests disappeared when opening them after KH1. Now I feel like I'm littering and I don't know which chest I open from a distance. Do you know how many times I ran up to an open chest thinking it was new? Too many. Give Carrie back her purple accents, please. Bear it. Wallace. Where is he? Why isn't he in any of the games? If it weren't for the Final Fantasy VII Remake, I'd never know how important he was. He's in the original group. If Yuna, Riku, and Pain can be repurposed as fairies, I'm sure you could fit Barrett in somewhere. He could own an accessory shop like Sid. Where is Barrett Wallace? KH1 is the only game to implement true mystery for Disney worlds on the world map and I really miss that. You didn't know which world you'd stumble upon next because all the undiscovered worlds were little question marks. I never grew up with this kind of mystery since my first game was Days, but I want it back. So stop spoiling the world and announcements, Square. Speaking of Days, the HD remake should have had actual gameplay instead of being remade into a movie. Bigger scenes, especially at the end, aren't as impactful because because the player doesn't get to engage with these battles at all. And since there is no gameplay, cutscenes will awkwardly skip past these battles that were in the original game. Just keep some missions and in-game bosses. KH3's new character designs don't have that oomph for me like with previous games. People joke about Tetsuya Nomura's tendencies to add belts and whistles everywhere, but I personally like the more out there designs the Destiny Island Trio had before. They're striking and stylish for the games they inhabit. I even like Riku's design in KH3. H1, but I find these new clothes either boring or unappealing to look at. Sora looks pretty nice, but I miss his outfit being a little weird. Where's the weird? I don't know what happened to it, I don't know where it went, but it needs to come back. Weird and ugly are not the same thing. Did you know that Riku has two long lost brothers? Their names are Noctis and Yozora. Why does Kari have three mismatched hemlines? Two is enough. Why are there three? But I like the little hoodie she has, that's cute. Why is Shion's outfit a recolor of Kari's? How does Axel wear leopard print pants and still look boring? If Anna has to get new clothes for the frozen tundra that is Arendelle, why can't Sora, Donald, and Goofy? Why are they walking around freezing their arms off? What sense does that make? It's cold! Hey, Donald, give me a coat! Give my sunshine son a coat, confound it. 
So those are my nitpicks. Now I'm going to briefly talk about something I don't see people bring up much. It doesn't have much to do with the story, but I wanted to put this in somewhere. Yeah, I think KH has a colorism problem. All the original heroic characters are light-skinned, except for Sora on a good day, but the ultimate villains so far were all visibly brown. Xehanort has numerous versions of himself throughout the games, and that includes all the brown-skinned men with silver hair and yellow eyes. Ansem, Seeker of Darkness, Xemnas, who's Organization 13's leader, and so on and so forth. Sora wasn't as dark as Xehanort and his clones, but he was still visibly darker than most other original characters. He has some melanin in the first couple of games, then in KH3, he almost looks as light as Kairi. Same thing happens with Terra. And then there's the whole thing with Ansem, the Wise, or... Diz. Okay. Xehanort really loves his identity theft, and one identity he stole was of Ansem the Wise, the real Ansem, not Seeker of Darkness. So the real Ansem also hides his true identity to KH2. When he throws off his bandages, uh... Dark skin is not an accessory. Who thought this was okay? Why did this aspect of his design get greenlit? What? What? I've also seen fan art of Norded characters where their skin would be much darker than it is in canon. Could you people stop equating dark skin with this game's version of evil? The yellow eyes and silver hair combo is enough. Dark skin is not an accessory. Actually, could people stop equating dark skin with evil in general? It's very gross. I was shocked to see an original dark skin character in Dark Roads trailer because it seems this one isn't a Xehanort clone as far as I know. Only time will tell. I personally think it'd be really nice if these game companies made more darker skin heroes and kept them that way. Enter KH's writing. The storytelling isn't always consistent or good. For a smaller example, the series has noticeably retconned and dropped plot points over the years. Donald and Goofy act like they've never been to Yantet's tower before in Cage 2, but in Birth by Sleep, they're right there when Aqua visits. You can clearly see that Mickey's designs are different in KH1 and 0.2, which share the same timeline at the end of both games. His default design couldn't be incorporated in the plot, so that's why 0.2 tries making it seem like he always looks like that and just lost his shirt to the darkness, I guess. Since he finds out Aqua's in the realm of darkness in KH1, he also never mentions her to anyone till KH3 rolls around. This wasn't the best retcon because his reasoning for leaving her there is... Why did you keep it from me for so long? I had to respect her choice. What about us? You could have given us a choice. We could have gone and helped her. I know. Not great. Xemnas alludes to knowing who Aqua is in KH2 after finding her empty armor in the castle basement of the world that never was. The cutscene takes its time with this too, never cutting away from him for three minutes. This amounts to nothing. He's dead now. After KH1, most games attempts at linking Disney worlds with the overall plot are also hit and miss. You could argue it's because Sora restored all the worlds. They were disconnected again and everyone was brought back home. But the story still tries making some Disney worlds skippable or not more important than what we're given. KH3 acts like the organization's plan is going to impact Frozen's story. The setup is nothing but fluff. The Arendelle world has the worst case of just the movie-itis in the series, including a shot-for-shot -shot remake of Let It Go. It looks impressive, yeah, but is it really necessary? Did we really need to hear the song again like it wasn't unavoidable for two years? It's not even one of the best Disney ballads out there. And while I personally don't think the narrative is confusing, the specific wording of plot elements can be. I'm not a theorist in the Kingdom Hearts fandom, so I don't prioritize things like what's in the box and what's it for. But I believe the games have been so concerned with the plot's technicality lately that the emotional cores don't feel as fully realized as they could be. It's like when the Beauty and the Beast remake tried writing around certain things the higher-ups probably thought weakened the story, when it wasn't that important at all. I mean, yeah, it was a little weird the townspeople from the original movie were unaware of a prince living in the forest, but if it was that big of a deal, critics would have panned it for that, right? 
At the same time, for all the explaining KH loves to do, sometimes it brushes over things that would benefit from more spotlight. Like other fans, I still don't get how Axel's a Keyblade wielder and a Guardian of Light too. His redemption arc is off screen, so it's awkward to see him become this quippy guy who makes corny, out of character jokes that break the fourth wall. Sorry boss, no one axes Axel. Got it memorized? Ooh, tomato, 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 I'm throwing tomatoes. KH also stumbled with writing the Wayfinder Trio's friendship, despite Terra, Aqua, and Ven being one of the main friend groups in the series. I love these archaic besties to bits. They have such tragic stories that it hurts, but their relationship isn't established well when they're first introduced. Birth by Sleep makes it clear they've already been close before the story starts. There are even references to the Destiny Island Trio to reinforce that. It'd work much better if the story showed us their friendship more than it told us about it. I do like when Aqua first talks to Ven. It shows her motherly instincts toward him in a natural way. But Tara shows up and starts monologuing about the world with confusing and awkward similes about Ven. Birth by Sleep tries to make a big brother dynamic out of this when Tara refuses to elaborate on what he means because he thinks Ven is too young to understand. But the dialogue for it feels forced. The light is their hearts and it's shining down on us like a million lanterns. What? I don't get it. In other words, they're just like you, Ven. What does that mean? You'll find out someday, I'm sure. I want to know now! Then Aqua says an observation out loud that feels too unfamiliar for this established, long-term friendship. <laughs> hey, what are you laughing at? I can't help it. You two would make the weirdest brothers. <laughs> Huh? <laughs> she she just noticed that now? They don't talk about their wants, their worries about the upcoming mark of mastery exam, nothing that gives true insight into their friendship. Birth by Sleep trips over all that characterization and goes straight to Aqua giving her friends Wayfinder charms. As a result, this specific symbolism about an unbreakable connection doesn't feel earned, and it makes their friendship less believable in narrative. Side note, this line, this line right here, when Xehanort freezes Ven? Ven! Are you okay? Atrocious. She could have said anything else. Why did she ask him a question at all when he's obviously incapable of answering? Of course he's not okay, he's a block of ice. I do have a few more gripes with the series writing, but I won't get into it here. However, I can say that out of all the ones I've played, KH3 epitomizes the story at its clumsiest. I know this isn't the most original take in the Kingdom Hearts fandom. Some people are probably writing really nice or really mean comments by now, but that's okay. Whether you love or hate KH3, I'm gonna make everyone a little mad. KH3 was not a waste of effort. Just like the rest of the series, it has its moments, regardless of fan reception for the game itself. I admit it, I had very high expectations that clouded my mindset and made me irrationally disappointed after playing. My feelings softened over time. On the contrary, it's got beautiful visuals and beautiful music, and the story is still fun to engage with. Look at Pirate Sora, look at him. Look at him. We've come so far. No more art style clashes. This all paid off. We've got Pirate Sora. In retrospect and on the record, I think it's a very good game that crumbled under poor writing and development hell near the end. During the end game section, after the characters finish traveling through Disney worlds, the pacing is noticeably rushed and cutscenes were more concerned with getting from point A to B than anything else. It's like the plot is ticking boxes and leaving little breathing room for emotion and build up. I'll talk about saving Aqua from the realm of darkness soon, but the reunion between her and Ven is shockingly nonchalant. They casually tell each other good morning and nothing else before the scene ends. They don't shed tears or hug it out and there's no background music. Before you think they'd have more to say, it's over. Mind you, Aqua and Ven haven't seen each other for 10 years. This plot point has been set up for such a long time, both in narrative and game-wise, that their reunion feels more dry than it should. I don't know, if I was stuck alone in eternal darkness for a decade, I think I'd have a much stronger reaction than this. 
but we don't have time for separate reunions. We gotta finish our errands. The Yen Sid Tower scene that follows is also, frankly, boring. The Guardians of Light gather around and reestablish how they're connected, their personalities just barely shining through their dialogue. Except for Axel and Sora, I guess. The gang's all here, mostly. Everyone's just standing around in one big room and reminding the audience how Aqua's met Kari before, but Axel knows Ven and... And so on and so forth. If you're looking for cool and fun interactions between various characters, you won't find it in the main game. This same problem persists during the first round of the Keyblade Graveyard introduction with Xehanort, and the second. Most characters just stand there and don't react. Why do specific characters forget they have Keyblades at their disposal? Why are Goofy and Donald pulling the weight here? Why do so many capable characters get nerfed for the story? Even the Paupu fruit scene between Sora and Kairi is lacking. A Paupu fruit is a fictional food in KH1 that carries a lot of symbolic weight. Its legend states that if two people share one, their destinies become intertwined and they'll remain a part of each other's lives no matter what. So Sora and Kairi eating one together would be a big deal, especially when KH1 and 2 set up this future event and other games reference how powerful the Paupu fruit is. But this moment's over before it begins. Instead of reminiscing sing about their adventures on Destiny Islands and how much they've seen, or talking for an extended amount of time at all, they promise to keep each other safe and that's it. You don't even see them eat the Palpu. Kairi repeats a legend to Sora and says she wants to be with him always, but this is just as dry as the rest of the cutscene. She adds a that's all at the end, which makes me think the writers intended her to be cheeky with this line, but neither her body language nor her tone of voice indicates this. It adds on to how matter of fact this intimate moment is presented to us. Maybe the pacing wouldn't be that bad if Sora and Co. saved Aqua and Ven earlier between Disney Worlds, so then the big, important stuff wouldn't be so backloaded. This complaint and easy hypothetical fix isn't new to me, as I've seen other fans share the same sentiments before. The DLC Remind feels like a quick remedy to some of these issues. KH3 is notorious for its development hell, to the point that it's the one corny joke people like making about the series as a whole. I can't wait till the next KH3 comes out in 2090. I can't wait till KH4 comes out in 3040. I can't, I can't wait, wait till, till the next KH3 comes out in 2090. Children. I can't I wait till KH4 until comes out in 3040. Oh get a, boy, oh boy. To get a 401k for so my excited. Many of the new components in Remind seem to have been for the main game, but were left out due to time restraints. Did you want Kairi to be playable from how much the series has set her up to be more present in combat? Don't worry, we got you for 30 extra dollars. Did you want to explore Skyla Ad Kylum, an original world that's been hyped up with a rich design and lots of detail to explore like Hollow Bastion and the world that never was? Don't worry, we got you for 30 extra dollars. Did you want to see the Guardians of Light have fun and cute interactions with each other, and also have them fight in one area together against the 13 vessels, because you believed that's exactly what they do, instead of getting separately closed off in different rooms for the final battle? Don't worry, we got you for 30 extra dollars. Did you want to see Final Fantasy characters in a game that markets itself off this very crossover with Disney characters in tow, even though they may not be super important to the narrative? Don't worry. We got you for 30 extra dollars. So this may not be a bad game overall, but it definitely has its flaws. For me, they really shine through with two of the most prominent female characters in the series. Let's talk about Anti-Aqua. KH3 trailers really hyped up Aqua getting norted. So much so that people thought it'd be a significant plot point and not a one-off boss battle. The trailers didn't show how she got norted, of course, but they made it seem like her nort status was crucial nonetheless. With her bright gold eyes and gradient hair, she rants about how resentful she is of Mickey for abandoning her in the realm of darkness for so long, how alone she's been, how the endless wandering has worn her down. It's tragic. She's right about Mickey screwing her over, but Aqua's descent into darkness doesn't really matter. The setup for it is weak. She gets hit with a ball of darkness, and literally bringing her back to the light takes nothing more than one short battle, while Sora shows up in the realm of darkness right in the middle of it. 
it circles back to all the rushed pacing. The only time Aqua's trauma explicitly affects her is during the big battle at the Keyblade Graveyard. She collapses in despair upon seeing the Heartless Tornado and envisions corrupted versions of herself context you'd be missing if you didn't play Remind. You could argue that the game tries showing her trauma through having her falter in a previous battle with the villain Vanitas when she and everyone else went to wake up Ven. It could mean she's tired. But the story does little with this hypothetical and as a result, she seems less capable only because the story needs her to be, not because of her trauma in the realm of darkness. Her battle with Vanitas seems to reinforce this. The game makes a huge deal out of her fighting to get to Ven. She cuts off everyone else to face Vanitas one on one and goes, Sorry, but you've seen me too weak, too often. Now it's my turn to shine. And she gets her butt kicked anyway. She takes a hit she clearly sees and could easily block with her Keyblade. And again, just like the other characters in this Keyblade graveyard scene with Terranor, she takes a strangely long time to react and some of the weapons she has at her disposal. She doesn't even confide in Ven against its tower. I would have liked to believe she puts on a front around characters she doesn't know that well, like Sora, Donald, and Goofy. Then her walls come down a little when she's alone with Ven and she admits how she's been really feeling, even if she doesn't want to explain what happened to her. But KH3 doesn't take advantage of their conversation to show anything like that. I don't want grand statements from Aqua about her trauma, but a more intimate conversation with Ven could have given more context to her actions and indirectly showed how these two are best friends. It didn't have to be a big thing either. Here's a bare bone example. I don't mind the anti-aqua boss battle in isolation, but the trailer surrounding it made it out to be something that it wasn't for KH3. Important. The way we got to this destination undermined it. The trip back home was also somehow just as fast as the journey. It's unknown if Aqua's trauma will be further explored in future games. Maybe she gets to reflect on everything she's gone through and eventually heal. Everyone in this cast needs to heal but some emotional wounds cut deeper than most. You've been thinking a lot lately, haven't you? Thanks to you. If you hadn't come here, I probably would have never thought of any of this. Kari, thanks. <laughs> You're welcome. Do you remember those boys who used to hang out with us? Riku? Yeah. I wonder whatever happened to him. I sure miss him. He's far away. But I know we'll see him again. Maybe waiting isn't good enough. I don't want to focus too much on how the other original female characters are handled. As few as there are in this large cast, I still think talking about them can get complicated. I adore them, but I don't always like how they're written. I think most of them need more fleshed out character arcs and definitely more screen time, but I don't want to get into that because I'd be here all day. This whole section's about Kairi. Why waste any more time? I'm sure the comments are going to be nice and nuanced about her. <sighs> oh Kairi, the writers and fans' blatant disrespect breaks my heart. KH seems like it'd give more attention to Kairi's role in the story because she's part of the original trio. Unfortunately, that's not true. She can't catch a break no matter how many games come out. Now that the writers are trying to give her more presence, the monkey's paw continues to curl for whoever wants to see more of her character. From the plot sidelining her to her characterization, something usually goes wrong. Even her clothing hinders her movement in KH3. Whether or not I like these designs doesn't negate how many skirts in KH specifically don't cut it for battle. This isn't like Sailor Moon. This guy wears a tux to fight crime. KH doesn't have Sailor Moon's aesthetics, so I don't expect the female characters to willingly walk into battle with a miniskirt. Instead of giving her pants or real shorts to wear, the creators made extra work for themselves by strategically placing Kari's legs in cutscenes so the camera doesn't upskirt her. It's strange that she has the most practical outfit in the first game when she doesn't engage in any combat whatsoever, but her KH3 outfit consists of a miniskirt in the middle of one of the 
the most important battles plot-wise. She's the only female character wearing one in heavy combat. Was it that hard for Nomura and the rest of the team to give her something more practical for her environment, especially because the animators had to work around her skirt? KH also constructs the story in a way Sakari so does as little combat as possible on screen, even physically stopping her from joining Sora and Riku on their adventures. After they reunite in KH1, Kari assumes she's going with Sora to finish the journey. He eventually tells her no and jokingly says, You'd kind of be in my way. So she complies and gives him her lucky charm. This is a sweet scene. I like it. I'm just pointing out how Kari is prevented from going with Sora. Okay? Okay. KH2 uses set pieces to physically keep her out of the battle scenes. Somehow, when everyone's running from danger, she and Mickey get conveniently stuck behind the door to Kingdom Hearts and she faints. No one knows why. She just faints. So she misses out on Sora slashing buildings. Right before they're all going home through a portal, it closes on her, cutting her off from the final boss battle. Oh boy. To be fair, the other Disney characters are cut off too, but they were able to actually engage in combat throughout unlike Kairi. She swings at some Heartless, but she wasn't in a full-fledged battle. KH3 finally makes her playable with Sora by her side, but only through Remind. So if you couldn't get it, you were out of luck. Like me. She goes Keyblade training with Axel, but it's all off screen. You see her a little bit in the Keyblade Graveyard gameplay. She's great! Then Xemnas snatches her up and she's MIA for the rest of the battle. Oh well. Melody of Memory. Let's put a pin in that. Also, did you notice that Kairi's the only character who has physically handed her Keyblade and doesn't summon it out of her own volition? It seems future titles will answer how Riku even got the Keyblade, but it still would have made much more sense if she summoned it herself. Axel, of all people, can summon his own Keyblade, no reason needed, but Kairi can't? Moving on. As the series progresses, Kairi gets less vibrant with little explanation as to why. Despite the short screen time she has in KH1 and 2, she's consistent and her personality shift can be somewhat understandable between these two games. When we first see her, she's a little rascal. She teases her friends with a cheeky grin and playful body language. So are you lazy bum. I knew that I'd find you snoozing down here. Ah! <laughs> and you're just as lazy as he is. <laughs> so you know this. Sora tells her about his cryptic experience from the beginning of the game and she smacks him on the head because she doesn't believe him. She's assertive and funny and slightly mysterious because she forgot where she came from before arriving at Destiny Islands. She's off screen and physically comatose for most of the game, but her kind and bold nature is at the forefront. KH2's Kairi is more wistful this time as she tries recalling her fractured memories of Sora. She vouches to stay on the mainland until she can remember who he is, juxtaposed to how she would hang out with him and Riku on the little island. When she gets her memories back, she goes out on her own to find her closest friends. I think she's less verbally spunky because she misses them. No more funny business for now. She's on a mission and she can't wait for them any longer. Maybe waiting isn't good enough. Then she finds her friends and goes back to taking jabs at Sora, though not as frequently and in your face. You know Sora is completely hopeless without us. Come on, Riku! KH3 attempts to give her more screen time, but this is where her personality takes a serious nosedive. She's more soft-spoken and breathy than ever before, and I don't think it's because of her new voice actor. Her mischief and cheekiness are non-existent. She's a rascal no more, not even a little quirky. The personality shift between KH1 and 2 probably implied that Kairi didn't want to let loose with her best friends missing. Maybe all that waiting changed her, but KH3 has no explanation for why she's so reserved. One of her gameplay lines is, please work, and her combat stance is pigeon-toed. You can make any kind of character interesting, no matter how they act, but there's little else to imply this development in Kari's character makes sense. We don't spend much time with her in KH3 to make any good guesses, and I doubt the story will show why she acts like this later on. She's an active character like always, but the writers neglected giving her a distinct personality, leaving her bolder traits behind 
behind. You can still be mature and bold at the same time. Just saying. However, Kari still has internal conflicts like the other characters do. I love when she reflects on her nobody nominee and how she feels guilty for taking away nominee's human existence. But we don't get to see Kari's conflicts fully develop because of the lack of screen time with her deeper thoughts and feelings. Her character arc, which I assume is her desire to grow stronger and join her friends on their adventures, is rarely explored. Even her relationship with Riku is underdeveloped. Sora and Kairi have some moments alone, Riku and Sora do too, but never Kairi and Riku. They're all supposed to be best friends, equally balanced. You'd think they have way more to talk about after what Riku's done to protect her, but in KH3, they barely acknowledge each other. Kari's lack of autonomy in the series is also a common discussion. She's kidnapped in KH1 and 2 and regulated to one place where she can mostly stay off screen. KH3 seemed like a beacon of hope before it was released. Dream Drop Distance gave her a secret cameo that first established her Keyblade training. Then the KH3 trailer showed her in the Keyblade graveyard with everyone else. It looked promising. The actual game gives her more screen time than before. She's reflecting on having a nobody and she's writing a letter to Sora again. She gets to participate in the big battle, something she was never allowed to do previously. And then you get to the part where she's actually fighting in the graveyard. This is where she gets kidnapped. Sora finally catches up with Riku and Mickey and Xehanort reveals Kairi's comatose body, telling Sora you require motivation. Sora looks on in horror as his best friends crystallize right before his eyes. He goes into a rage and confronts Xehanort up close, giving him exactly what he's wanted all along, a final clash to create Kingdom Hearts. Kairi doesn't reappear until the end of the game after Sora has already sacrificed himself to restore her. Her kidnapping and death, sorry, her crystallization, is treated with the care and tactic of a bull in a china shop. The Kingdom Hearts fandom speculated that she'd get killed this way in KH3 and many fans prayed that she wouldn't. The game acts like Kairi's kidnapping is more of a small inconvenience. No one comments on it except for Sora and he doesn't even tell the others that she's missing. Riku has to ask what happened to her when Sora name drops her. When Riku finds out, he says nothing more about it. Where's Kairi? Wait, huh? is she in trouble? <sighs> Yeah, Xemnas took her. <laughs> and then literally three minutes after her crystallization, in the same scene, Axel cracks a joke, which is already totally inappropriate, but he apparently doesn't know she's gone because Sora, Riku, and Mickey don't mention it to him. Or anyone, except for Donald and Goofy, that's nice. Shion is the only other character who acknowledges Kairi. Xehanort telling Sora that he requires motivation to fight him is also contrived, as if Sora needs any more reason for all the things Xehanort and his clones have done before. I know Sora's never met the original old man before KH3, but those other Xehanort clones are all him. He's caused chaos for Sora and other people for several years, so wouldn't they have fought already without Kairi getting involved? It's cheap. It's lazy. It's bad writing. It's... it's... it's fridging. Oh my god, they fridged Kairi. The woman in a refrigerator trope or fridging is a trope where a usually female character is depowered, brutalized, and or killed to motivate a usually male character and move his plot forward. The term originally refers to a Green Lantern comic in which the titular hero finds his murdered girlfriend stuffed in the fridge. Determining if a character's death is a fridging can get complicated. Just because a male character is sad about a female character's death or brutalization doesn't make it a fridging. However, the main point of this trope in a narrative is that the brutalized character in question is used for nothing more than a plot device for someone else's story and development. The term is used to criticize the treatment of female characters and male-dominated stories. It's worse when these characters have little depth to them to begin with or if it's rarely explored. Kairi suffers from this to a T. The series doesn't focus on her as much as other characters in the trios, and when the games attempt to explore who she is, they only skim the surface. 
It's not that her crystallization isn't important to the actual narrative, nor that it's supposedly out of character for Xehanort to do. Of course villains do evil things to good characters. The man turns a teenage boy into an icicle and drops him off a cliff. Attempted murder sounds right up his lane. The problem is that these evil things come at the expense of a female character getting brutalized to literally motivate the male protagonist and to move his story along. Xehanort harms Kyra specifically to make Sora angry. It'd be slightly different if Xehanort crystallized her in the middle of battle without intentionally provoking Sora. He may have beef with other versions of Xehanort, but the writers probably thought that wasn't enough. They gave him man pain through brutalizing the important female character in his story. It's a poorly constructed way to get a reaction out of the other characters and the audience, especially because she has little involvement in the series anyway. Kairi getting fridged is not the twist some of you think it is. This trope is so common that it has a name and many fans weren't shocked this happened. Whoa, this male villain brutalizes a female character the male protagonist is close to and in turn prioritizes how the male characters feel? So cold-blooded. Sure, but it's tacky. Out of all the weird directions the plot took in KH3, this is what disappointed me the most. It's cool we have a whole new plot point to worry about now that Sora's gone, but was Fridge and Kairi worth it? This is the saddest moment in the series for me. Not because I think it's emotional for the story's context, because Kairi is treated like a prop after all that setup. Because it's cheap, lazy, bad writing. A year later, after KH3's release, the Melody of Memory trailer drops. It looks like a cute, inconsequential rhythm game until the gameplay footage is cut off and we see Kairi! Kairi talking to a metaphysical representation of her fear for Xehanort. We get some of her backstory on Radiant Garden. Drama! Oh my god, she's on the cover. She's on the cover. This is her game. We got a Kairi game. Steps through the door that marks the start of his journey. Oh wow. Sora, Riku, and I, wanted to I know it's for newcomers, but that is a lot of info dumping narration. Um, yada yada yada, skip the summary, skip Harappa the Rapper. Okay, now it's time for what fans really came for. We get some backstory, Kairi's starting to learn about her past. She doesn't have any personal and emotional responses to all that, but it's fine. It's fine. She's on the cover, it's fine. She falters a little bit in combat, but she's got this. She's ready. She's calling upon the strength of her friends and her own heart. She turns into Sora on screen for the Xehanort battle that we don't see her physically participate in. Yeah, Sora's not really there, but Kairi doesn't even get to fight her own battle in her own head. Is this really her game? Is this what we have to settle for? Sidelining in her own game where she only shows up in original cutscenes for 30 minutes? Okay, look, no one really knows why Kairi turns into Sora at the moment. I know there's some kind of metaphor or symbolism to it, but that doesn't mean that metaphor is executed well. Maybe it symbolizes Kairi realizing she's still too weak for battle and needs Sora's help. Well, maybe it symbolizes some absolute BS to make Sora playable in a game that's supposed to be about Kairi. She's on the cover, come on! Then Kairi's back. Xehanort keeps monologuing and repeats the exact same thing he said in the flashback Kairi already saw. She wakes up and everyone repeats what Xehanort said verbatim for who knows why. Now they're talking about finding Sora. Fairy Godmother shows up, talks about some plot stuff. Then Kairi asks to go with Riku on his journey to look for Sora and he discourages her. And she agrees with him because she says she needs to train more. Why would she need more training? She and Axel trained in a dimension where time moves differently, so they had literally all the time in the world to get on everyone else's level. Anyway, she goes back to Yentet's tower, expresses her desire to train under Aqua, then there's some stuff about Mickey going off on his own. And that's kind of it for Melody of Memory, besides all the plot stuff with a world that's neither of light nor darkness, but somewhere on the other side. And I... Oh.
I'm sure Melody of Memory is super fun as a rhythm game. It looks fun. I assume it's good. It's valuable for that. But in the Kairi department, it doesn't deliver much. The trailers hyped up her presence and backstory when it was all under half an hour at most. It's not automatically a bad game because it's not a full-fledged Kairi campaign, but it does little for her character or her gameplay because she almost has none. She doesn't get to physically engage in combat. All the cutscenes I watched barely skimmed how she felt about any of these events. She has no comment on how traumatic her death was for her or learning she came from Radiant Garden. We don't even get to see how she feels about being left behind all the time. It's just... Well, I know I need to do better, and that's it. She isn't allowed to express any deep emotions about this on screen. How exactly does she feel about where she came from? How Xehanort used her as an experiment for his scheme? How everyone else gets to go on cool adventures, but her own two best friends prevent her from joining them? Who knows? Nomura said himself that this game's story wasn't going to seriously advance the plot. I get that, but the story portion could have gone so much more into Kairi's personality and feelings. Her narration is presented as facts with no personal asides. The plot is there, but not her character. The training thing also annoys me, but at least she'll be training with Aqua next time. Maybe we'll get a real extended campaign about them going on their own adventure to a bunch of Disney worlds with actual boss battles and cutscenes where they bond. Kairi could get that battle stance fixed too. I would have also personally been content with Aqua and Kairi going with Riku so Aqua can train Kairi along the way. It'd be such an interesting team up because not only would Aqua and Kairi get to bond, but so would Aqua and Riku. Have them talk about their struggles with darkness. And Riku and Kairi would also be bonding like the best friends they're supposed to be. Give them their moment together. The creators seem repulsed to treat Kairi like the main heroine she is. The more present she has, the more the game seems to push against it. Her clothing, personality, and autonomy as a character get compromised. Honestly, even though she isn't my favorite, it sucks. It sucks to see her character nerfed this way. It sucks to see fans act like her decentering is their own fault and blame her for getting brutalized. It also sucks to see fans hate her so badly. Much of the time, whenever a female character is underdeveloped and pushed to the side in a male-dominated story, fans won't just hate how her character is mishandled because of the writing, but they'll hate her as a person. Person. They'll villainize and wish violence on her when she hasn't actively done anything to cause such anger. The biggest crime she's committed is that the writers don't take her seriously. And no, it's not clever for any of you to further curry sidelining by saying you don't want her in the rest of the games as a result of her bad writing. Why complain about it but then shut down her potential censoring at the same time by wishing she stayed dead or never left the islands? I hope all my rambling about her will be outdated in the future, including the other negative things I said about the rest of the female cast. There's still time to do better, so I'm gonna hold out for as long as it takes, even if it amounts to nothing. Nothing wrong with a little hope. I hope the rest of the series gets back on track with its writing too. KH3 feels like a fluke, so maybe a lack of delays can benefit the storytelling and the writing could regain its quality. Oh, by the way, Kairi should be able to work her way up on her own adventure like everyone else instead of getting regulated to off-screen training in a controlled setting with no real consequences. Give her a real campaign with real stakes and real battles in real worlds where she makes real friends and grows. KH never had realistic training, so why does Kairi have to cater to this ideal that never existed? The only other characters who trained in a controlled environment were Terra and Aqua and they are trained to be Keyblade Masters. They even went on their own journeys by facing bigger enemies head on and going to new places. For something like KH, that seems more than a realistic way for Kai to gain experience, now wouldn't you say? It's so easy to have her join Aqua and go world hopping. Sora and Riku have done it multiple times. That's how they grew stronger. Axel already traveled for years before he had to train with Kairi. She wants to fight. She wants to grow stronger. Let her have fun, and if 
anybody insinuates that she dislikes Riku or that she's secretly evil or that she'd have a deeper personality if she was, I don't want to hear it. I'm not listening to people who say she's a bad person or she's corrupted for having flaws that are expressed in flawed ways. I didn't ask you for your garbage opinion. Kingdom Hearts 4. It's gonna be a thing! I just want to gush about this right now. I mean, my god. The 20th anniversary event for KH was a little over a month ago. Everyone had their predictions for new stuff, but I'm still really shocked about the KH4 announcement. It doesn't feel real. I can't wait. It looks amazing. I even believe a fan theory that Sora is using some of Xehanort's fighting style because the old man bequeathed him before going into that good night forever. We're already getting snippets of the plot and a final Fantasy versus 13 Sora. A fantasy based on reality, huh? Yep, that explains it. I may not really care for Yozuro right now, but I totally understand why Nomura revived versus 13 this way. I would also implement a passion project into another work of mine if my vision never saw the light of day because I was replaced. Okay, Nomura was previously directing Final Fantasy vs. 13, and he had a lot of ideas for it, but through development hell, it was rebranded into a completely different product called Final Fantasy 15, so Nomura got replaced with another director, and he could only work on KH3 instead. Now it seems like he's trying to sneak in Versus 13's original essence of KH, but in a way that fits with the plot and doesn't become a one-to-one -one Final Fantasy game. Sora looks realistic right now because he's in a completely different world that has something to do with reality and fiction turned on its head. The other Disney characters like Donald and Goofy still look exaggerated and cartoony because they're not in the same world as Sora because he's like dead? Please stop thinking the rest of the series is gonna look realistic. Sora's style change is intentional for the story, please! My feelings for the Cage series aren't clear-cut. It concerns me, it disappoints me sometimes, but no matter what game I'm playing, it somehow always puts a smile on my face. Maybe not for the whole playthrough, but I still manage to enjoy something. I want these games to improve as much as possible. The storytelling, the characters, the level design, the gameplay, because I want them to be the best they can be, then somehow I'll love them more than I already do. KH has been around for 20 years with no signs of stopping anytime soon. It's amazing to see the series last so long. I'm glad it wasn't lost to time. Disney animators and writers are just now blatantly referencing it in their media and it gives me so much serotonin. Apple shortbread pie with a scoop of sea salt ice cream. A common farewell dessert in certain parts. Finally, some real food! Oh, I'm so sorry. This was Scrooge's favorite dessert. Where are all the KH references in the theme parks? Where's the gummy ship ride? The Papu fruit snacks? The blue seesaw ice cream on a stick? Tokyo Disney has seesaw ice cream, but it doesn't look like the kind from the games. And the American theme parks don't have it at all. It's so easy. You already have so much money. Come on. I was introduced to the series through days, watching all the Cartoon Network commercials in October and anticipating Christmas that year. Seeing these anime people and Mickey Mouse sport a black coat was new and fresh and a little weird, but very, very cool. I was never the same after the Christmas of 2009. I didn't finish the game because I got stuck on a boss, but that's not the point. The characters, their fully rendered animations, the large-scale story interfering with their relationships. I loved it all, confused as I was with the original characters outside Organization 13. I only got a snippet of the plot, but I was sucked in anyway. Eventually, I I fell in love with the rest of the games, anticipating what the story had next to offer. And here I am, 13 years later, with that exact same mindset. I'm only two years older than KH1. I can appreciate these wacky little crossovers more because I noticed things I couldn't when I was 10. Big and small, good and bad. KH jumpstarted my love for large-scale fantasy and the art of animation. It introduced me to Final Fantasy for the first time, which made me want to play the remake. Best decision I made in 2020. It also made me want to create weird stories without holding back. Because, let's face it, KH is a little weird. Sephiroth in the same universe as Minnie Mouse? It's a little weird! I love it! And yeah, I do get a little miffed when people diss these games and make the same old jokes about KH being confusing and silly and confusing and silly and silly confusing and silly, 
and confusing. We can't forget that. Or if someone very badly misinterprets something that's too obvious to miss. Roxas is integral to the plot progression of KH2, and I can't believe he missed the whole point of the first couple hours of the game. I never want to play as Roxas again. Yeah, that's that rough. first, like, you're in like a fake dreamland is this garbage character nobody cares mm -hmm. about. This is my longest video yet. It took a lot out of me just to write this script. I've struggled with editing it and constructing it in a way that made sense. In the video editing? God, what a nightmare. But it was all worth it. I talked about my favorite video game for an hour. I had fun and I'm glad I could get my feelings out there to anybody watching. I didn't think I could get to this point with so many people seeing what I make. And I'm happy that you've also engaged with the rest of my work. That's, that's really cool. Um. <laughs> I, I didn't know where else to put this, so I'm, I'm just really happy. Like, wow. Just like my feelings, KH isn't simple and clean. It's rough around the edges, so much so that, at least to me, the bumps are pretty noticeable, but it manages to do a lot of great things along the way. It's sweet and strange and bombastic and genuine. The future of Kingdom Hearts is unpredictable, but it always has a place in my heart, and I wouldn't have it any other way. Within it lies the heart of all worlds, Kingdom Hearts.